Well, good afternoon. My name is Steve Lemon. I'm one of the medical oncologists here. And uh, today, I'm going to present some data on the PARP inhibitors, which is a, uh, a new target uh, for cancer treatment and I think has some real interesting data. So I'll just remind everybody that in our group now, um, there's four of us, and I, we have what I like to refer to as the three amigas. So we have uh, Dr. Popa, Dr. Baumgars, and then our newest doctor, Dr. Palaniapin, who's here today, too. Yeah. And just a plug for a couple websites. Um, my website here, um, if you're ever interested in looking at more of me, no. Um, and then there's another website called myhopespace.com, which is actually put together by um, one of the IT employees here at Methodist, and he and his uh, wife. And it's actually it's a social network site for people um, touched by cancer. So I'd, it's really a pretty nice site. I'd encourage you to take a look at that sometime. But first, I want to go over the top 10 reasons why I want health care reform. Okay. Number 10. Everywhere I walk, I'm tripping over health care waste. I just hate that. Number 9. Going postal has a whole new meaning. Number 8. Cash for clunkers is now dash for dunkers. You want that donut? Not going to happen. Number seven. I'm on a death panel. Do I get free food with that? Number six. Lawyers don't qualify. Too bad on that one. Number five. Sorry, but your aspirin prescription costs $80 billion. Price went up. Number four, my master's of public health degree will finally come in handy. My mom will be happy about that. Number three, I can charge for both chemotherapy and organic vegetables at the co-op. Number two, I didn't like my patient-friendly hometown service, personal attention, see the new cancer patient right away, return the sick cancer patient phone call the same day, small practice anyway. And the number one reason why I want health care reform, I always wanted to be a Starbucks barista. There we go. So anyway. But seriously, if we look at... Um, mortality for the country. Cancer uh, deaths are the second leading cause of death in the U.S. behind heart disease, um, which stays number one. But we are doing better. So the, uh, the reported death of America is premature because we are working on our health and it's, it's improving. So heart disease um, has come down from five or six years ago from 29% of deaths down to 26%. So we've improved that. Cancer mortality has also improved because otherwise this 23% would have been a higher proportion of deaths. So we are actually um, healthier now than we were um, in the past. Um, on the talk today, I'm going to focus mostly on breast cancer. And uh, this is the latest uh, cancer statistics from the American Cancer Society showing that the most common cause of um, cancer in women is breast cancer. And uh, you can see here quite far above lung and then uh, colon. But the incidence has been coming down uh, over the last few years, which they think is likely because women are not taking as much hormone replacement therapy. So that's been good. 
if we look at the deaths, lung cancer is still the leading cause of death in women, but breast cancer second and also um, improving over the last few years. So we are making progress um, with what we're doing. Now what I want to talk about uh, this afternoon are three subjects. Triple negative breast cancer, the mutations BRCA1 or mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, um, hereditary and sporadic, and then um, a new therapy that's directed at the poly ADP ribose um, and these are called PARP inhibitors. So by the time we're done, hopefully you'll understand the connection of those uh, three things. That's my goal anyway. Now when we look at triple negative breast cancer, we know that there's an association between that and mutations in the BRCA1 um, gene. So that's been um, recognized. And clinically, um, if we look at triple negative breast cancer, which is defined as negative, a cancer that's negative for expression of the estrogen receptor, negative for progesterone receptor, and the HER2 protein is not overexpressed. Um, we know that um, those cancers tend to be very aggressive tumors. Um, they account for about 15% of all breast cancers, and if you look at the number of breast cancers in the world, that would calculate to about 170,000 cases. So that's a significant number. 30% um, of these patients will develop metastatic disease, and when they do, it tends to be quite aggressive, involving, involving visceral organs, brain, and with very short survivals, um, because our treatment options are somewhat limited um, for them. And here's a slide that compares some of the tumor characteristics in cancers that are found in patients that have germline BRCA1 mutations, so they inherit that from birth, and patients who have triple negative uh, breast cancer. So patients with mutations in BRCA1 or 2 genes can have triple negative breast cancer. They don't always have that. And uh, the same thing on triple negative breast cancer, you can find hereditary mutations, but you don't always find them. Um, but both patterns tend to be negative for these um, protein uh, expression, tend to have mutant p53 gene status. Um, as I mentioned on the hereditary side, um, the, a mutation has occurred in the gene which th therefore inactivates that protein and the function of that protein um, is impaired. In the triple negatives, there may not be a hereditary mutation, but the activity or the expression of the BRCA1 and 2 protein is diminished or is not active. Um, and the histology tends to be high grade. Um, and, and these tend to be fairly sensitive to DNA damaging agents, which I'm going to talk more about that um, in a minute. Now our current treatment for triple negative breast cancer is somewhat uh, limited. At diagnosis, most patients do receive adjuvant chemotherapy with the best drugs that we have, um, generally an anthracycline, taxane, and cyclophosphamide. If someone develops a recurrence, we, we often do not use those same drugs to try to treat the recurrence. Um, if they do get um, metastatic disease, then the progression-free survival is often short, and uh, one option now would be to use Taxol and Avastin together, uh, but again, not a lot of options. Lately, there's been some work showing that um, there's activity in these cancers with uh, a, a platinum, like cisplatin or carboplatin, and gemsar, and I'll, I'll show you a study on that um, towards the end of the talk. 